community he truly adores. So please give it up for Zach Gordon. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Is this thing on? Are we on? Yeah, okay. Hi everyone, I am so happy to be here. I'm coming from Washington DC and I've wanted to be at WordCamp London for years now, so to have the opportunity is really cool. Y'all do a smash up job, so thank you. So today we're gonna have a quote unquote workshop. Ideally I was hoping we'd have a good like three hours to get into the code and practice building everything. Um, but we only have 40 minutes. So what we're gonna do instead is I'm gonna talk at a high level and then go through a bunch of different code samples and point out a bunch of things that as you begin developing on your own, you'll wanna know about and be aware of. So if you have a computer, there is a code repo and you could also get the slides at goomberg.courses slash WordCampLondon and um, follow along there, but it won't really be something where I'll be giving you really enough time to follow along. My apologies there. So uh, she mentioned a little bit back about me, my background is in education, and I started to really focus in depth on Gutenberg after WordCamp US when Matt was like, it'll be out in April, by the way, it's April, right? And I'd say from following it, it has developed so quickly and it's very feature complete-ish and has come a long way and there's a lot of refinement still going on, but I think it's important for all of us to know the code behind it because in the entire time I've been working on it, the only things that have really changed are like the name of this or this referred to that or things have got simpler to do. So it's not like the API and major stuff is really shifting. So I, I feel at, in terms of investing your time to learn it, I think you're, you're very safe now. Now we're not gonna get into the questions of should you use Gutenberg or does it apply to this or can it do that as much? I'm just gonna show you behind the scenes how it works. So the goal for today is to talk at a high level about the different JavaScript libraries Gutenberg introduces. As you know, it brings React and Redux and things like that into WordPress core. And then we have to talk about the whole tooling system. We are beyond the age of writing jQuery and um, you know, not using, using compiling tools. So you'll, you'll hear me talk a little bit about this. And I'll just say that if you are of the opinion that you don't need to learn ES6 or React and you don't wanna learn how to compile stuff, you need to change your attitude about this, okay? The entire rest of the web world is way beyond where most people in the WordPress space are and you have no excuse not to play catch up. The cool thing is, is that Gutenberg already has leveled up the entire system of the WordPress JavaScript code, so it's doing a lot of it for you. Um, we'll talk about how to pull in the, the JavaScript and CSS, we'll talk about architecture of a block, and then I'll just get into a big repo of demo blocks that you could learn from and download and play with, and hopefully have time for Q&A. Now, to make this a little bit more workshoppy, if you have questions as we go, please just raise your hand, and our lovely assistant here will come and let you ask. The only thing I reserve the right to do is say, this is way out of scope. Can you come ask me this later? Because it's gonna take me an hour to explain my, my opinions on this. Um, and maybe I'll say, can we talk about this at the end? So otherwise, please just uh, raise your hand as you have questions. I couldn't find my glasses before I got on the plane, so you all are an entire beautiful blur to me, so I can't really see too well, so hopefully she'll uh, uh, be able to see for me. A sea of just happy blur. All right, <clears throat> these are the main libraries I wanna talk about in terms of what Gutenberg brings to the table. The first one is WP Element. So React is abstracted, and what we mean by that is that if we go to the Gutenberg repo and we look under the element library, now you might not be able to understand what all this code is, so I'm just gonna explain it to you. It basically pulls in all these elements from the React library, so it loads React, pulls all this stuff in, and then goes through the process of simply exporting it exactly as it got it. So if you've used React before, then you're gonna get the exact same things that you would have had before, but you're going to get them referenced as wp.element instead of capital React. But it's pretty much the exact same thing. They're not changing anything under the hood, but this is really smart because if React changes in the future or we want to modify something, the WordPress API isn't going to break and they can shift things behind the scenes. So this is, I think, a really smart approach. The next thing we see is WP blocks, and WP blocks and WP components are kind of similar, so I'm gonna to try to explain some of the differences between them. But in WP blocks, we see a lot of functions that help us build blocks. So when we create a block, we use this function 
register block type that's stored in blocks. All of the core blocks are also stored in blocks. So one of the cool things that you could do is come into the Gutenberg library, go into blocks, library, and here are all the blocks that come loaded with WordPress. And this list will grow and grow as more things are added. And from what I hear, I've never seen this list, but I hear there's a list of more coming. So um, the other nice thing about this is that these blocks are built very much in the same way that you would build your own block. So for one of the first times in WordPress, we have this really beautiful, well-written code base where you can almost come in and just start copying and pasting. Hey, how did they get this button here? How did they get to this to this? You just go in, you look at it, you copy and paste it over, and for the most part, it really works, which is really cool and um, kind of a new age in WordPress development. Now we also get inside of blocks some other helper things. So if we want to add a toolbar or we want to add um, the inspector bar off to the side, these things that are really tied to blocks specifically, all of these little snippets of code are built for us and exist in blocks. Then we migrate into components, which is a kind of higher level folder. So things that maybe the editor uses or something that's super generic, like a tool tip, a button, a panel, things like that that are more generic are gonna be in components. And my guess is that as Gutenberg slowly begins to evolve into more and more of WordPress that you will see this library uh, grow. The cool thing about this is that if you go to start building UIs, we can rely on the core WordPress UI elements instead of needing to write our own CSS, write our own HTML, and we can really just drag and drop and say, hey, I want a button. Give me a button, and it gives it to you, and that's so nice. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes it gets a little under my skin when you install these different themes and plugins, and they're like, yeah, making the whole thing orange with white text would be a great idea, and we'll completely shift all of the conventions. And so I think hopefully what we'll see is a more uniform UI, and I'd like to personally encourage you and ask you to follow these conventions and use as many of the built-in components as possible. If you're not familiar with the term component, it's just a little snippet of code that can be reused and usually comes with its own styling, maybe a little bit of functionality built in out of the box. Go, go internationalization. Um, I'm very excited for Pascal's talk later on this, so I will let him extend on that. But hopefully, if you've ever built anything in WordPress, you've used like underscore, underscore, underscore E or escape HTML, underscore, right? Yeah, I can't really see hands, but yes, I'm gonna assume everybody said yes. So this is super that we now have this on the client side in JavaScript. So we can have all of our JavaScript uh, strings of text be translated super easily. So you'll see anywhere in a Gutenberg block or in Gutenberg code, you want to have text wrapped inside this underscore underscore function, which we'll look at. Finally, we have WP data and some offshoots of it. And if you've dealt with complex JavaScript applications before, at some point you need to begin keeping track of the state of the application or what's going on in memory. You can't save every single interaction to a database and reload the page or depend on Ajax calls to save everything to some backend. So much more is done live in memory. The cool thing about this is that the core team is starting to load up a bunch of data into this automatically. So if you want the post ID, you want this information, you want that information, you don't have to write your own queries. You could just say, hey, data, give me this. Hey, data, give me that. And you could also begin to create your own data stores. So if you're someone like the fabulous Yoast team that does in crazy complex plugins, then you have this at your disposal to um, basically keep track of all your application's memory. So these are the basic libraries. We'll get into most of these top four ones. The data is a little bit more complex, so we probably won't get that far today. And the interesting thing about these is that these are global variables, which should make every JavaScript developer in the room go, ah, that's probably not a good idea. But I've kind of grown to like it, and I think what we're gonna see here is an evolution. So right now, there's a lot of code inside of Gutenberg that just lives in Gutenberg. And little by little, they're going through and pulling this out and throwing it up into npmjs.org slash WordPress. So now we're starting to get a bunch of WordPress packages. So the modern development workflow, whether you like it or not, is to import a ton of different packages into your application and rely on those for a lot of the heavy lifting. So right now, when you want to build a Gutenberg block, you have to access global state. And I'll talk about what that means and show you some examples. 
Behind the scenes, they're starting to put more and more things in packages, pull them in for you, and then make them available in global state. We will get to the point, and it is starting to evolve to, where if you wanted to pull these in directly to your application um, for maybe testing reasons or something else, or maybe you're starting to develop with Gutenberg outside of WordPress, do y'all know there's a standalone Gutenberg editor? So you could just start using uh, Gutenberg on its own completely outside of WordPress. So eventually we'll get to see more and more packages outsourced in this way, and whether we access them through a global variable or packages directly um, will depend on just how things go. I'm not sure. But I can say in just the few months that I've been working on this, some of these libraries have been super helpful, like browserless config, so our Babel files will show used to be this big, and now it's just one line saying, hey, I'm just gonna use what WordPress did, and we go from there. So we have a WP object, and if you haven't played or with Gutenberg before, or if you've played with JavaScript and WordPress, you probably have never needed to access the WP object. It exists in the admin and on the front end. You get a lot more when it's loaded in the admin, but if we do wp.i189, we'll get that entire library. If we do wp.element, we'll get the entire React library. And just to show you real quick what I mean by that is that if I come in, to something that's not broken. And I open up my inspector, and I type WP, I get this huge object, which has all of this stuff built into it, including things like Element. And when I open up Element, this is the entire React library right there in global scope. Now, we probably don't want to be writing out all of this in super long format, so we use something called uh, destructuring. I embarrassingly refer to it as deconstructing in my entire JavaScript course. Is Thorsten here? Okay, there's someone here who wrote a great review of the course and pointed out that I incorrectly referred to it the entire time. But basically what this allows you to do, if you have something called wp.element.component, you could write it in this way and then just refer to it as component by itself. So at the top of every, or most of the Gutenberg files, you'll see something like this, where we just pull out everything that we need so we could refer to it by shorthand. It's not necessary. You could write wp.blocks.rich text every time you want, if you wanted to, but I don't think you want to, and I've just been following the conventions of the, the core devs, so that's what I would suggest for you. So let's move on to talking about tooling and enqueuing. The main tools I'm gonna to talk about are Babel, Webpack, and NPM. And then we have two new hooks inside of WordPress. You've, you've all enqueued a CSS or JavaScript file, right? Okay, otherwise I'm not sure why you're in a Gutenberg development workshop, but hopefully uh, this isn't new to you, and you've used you know, WP and Q scripts to pull in uh, scripts and styles before. Now we have two new ones. So, in QBlock Editor Assets, we'll take all your JavaScript and CSS and load it on every page where Gutenberg is active. I imagine this might adapt as Gutenberg starts to reach into more places, but right now it's just in the editor. Excuse me. So if you wanted to build a block, you hook in your JavaScript using this first hook here. The other thing about Gutenberg is that we want our styles in our blocks to match what they'll look like on the front end, right? So most of the CSS we're going to use in QBlock assets so that the same styles are applied on the front end and they're also applied in the editor so that you can see them um, both. So what you're usually gonna find is that your JavaScript will be enqueued within QBlock editor assets and your CSS will be enqueued with in QBlock assets. There's some variety to this, but in general it works that way. I'll also throw out, if you're theming and you want to design blocks to look a certain way for your theme and you use the normal enqueuing process for a theme, they'll look that way on the front end, but they won't look that way on the admin. So there's some discussion around how is the, or what's the best way to approach this, and I think it's still being, talk to Tammy later, she'd be happy to give you some insight there. It's, it's being evolved. Um, but just be aware of that, that when you start styling for blocks, and of course you want your theme to make all the blocks look the sexiest, right? So you might have to do some enqueuing on the back end as well for that, or you might not. Uh, let's talk about tools a bit. So in this plugin repo, again, if you go to Hootenberg, Rick 
Here are the slides, and then this is the plugin repo. So you can get all the stuff I'm talking about here. Put all your blocks in a plugin, and that's what this is, is just a plugin. Okay, so the first thing we'll start with is Babel. And what Babel will do is take advanced JavaScript that cannot yet be processed in the browser and rewrite it in a way that can be processed in the browser. It'll also allow us to write HTML-like syntax in our JavaScript and translate that back into create element and create text node and all of these things behind the scenes. When the first version of this course, interestingly, was If you look at the Babel file for this, notice that we used to have to set up all of this. So there were a few, and actually I ripped out a bunch of stuff here. There should be more in here that lists like exactly what kind of browsers you wanted to support, how far back you want to support, and you have to tell it that, hey, we're going to be using JSX and use WordPress's JSX to help um, process this and some other stuff going on. But because WordPress is pulling these out as separate packages, I can now in my configuration say, hey, just do, just use the WordPress defaults. And this is really cool because what I imagine is over the next year or two, we will be able to stop having to determine in independent agencies what our standards should be. And we could just say, hey, we're following the WordPress standards of what browsers we will support. I don't know if that's going to work for everyone, but I imagine for a lot of people, it'll take the load off to just blame WordPress or thank WordPress, depending on your opinion there. So more and more configuration files are going to get simpler like this. They're working on ESLint. There's um, an editor config that you could borrow from WordPress as well. Our webpack, I would take the rest of the time to explain this. But basically, um, I like this webpack file. If you're interested in webpack, come talk to me later. And I will wrap about this with you. Why are my, this is all white. Um, hold on a second. Live coding examples. Let's try that, shall we? No. That's strange. OK. Um, I'm going to go dark on you guys, because at least then we'll see it. I feel like things like parentheses and curly braces are kind of important for our code. So what this is basically going to do is run through all of our JavaScript files, all of our SAS files, compile them down, and then it's going to take anything that's, that's named editor and anything that's named style in terms of, this could be SAS or CSS, and it's going to save them into two different files. So everything that's labeled as editor will be saved to a blocks.editor.css, and everything that's saved as a style will be saved to style.css, and then those will be loaded by our plugin on the front end and in the back end, um, depending on how they're named. The other thing that we'll see is a lot of these plugins that you build with a bunch of blocks will have an index file that will list all of the blocks. So this is kind of what we tell Webpack is our entry file, and then it will go from there and start finding everything. I'd really like to encourage folks to follow the naming conventions that WordPress core does. I've seen a lot of like examples and kind of generator stuff that name their main block files as block.js. And I think this is a really bad idea, because if in the React JavaScript-y Webpack world, if you name something with index.js, I could just refer to the folder, and it will find it automatically. If we're naming our main index.js file, block.js, we have to um, manually refer to it as block.js. The other thing is that if we look at any of the core Gutenberg blocks, Let me find a more complicated one. Notice that they have an index.js file, and this is going to be the registration of the block. And then they have a block.js file where they break out any real complex stuff for building out the edit functionality. So if you're naming your main file block.js, and then you pull out something else, like I, I just I don't love that pattern. So please. Name your stuff, uh, follow the general React JavaScript naming conventions of index for your main files. We have a Webpack, and then we have NPM. So as I mentioned, the, the conventions today are to reference a bunch of 
external things, pull those in, and then run your code based off of it. Not all of these are necessarily needed for every project, but this is what a fairly common block project will look like, and that's why I gave it to you in this boilerplate. Some of these are dealing with um, the transpiling of your JavaScript. Some of them are dealing with processing your JavaScript. And then we'll see more and more like this that are at WordPress something that are pulling in WordPress conventions. Tooling in three minutes. Okay. So now we can start talking about the actual architecture of a block, and then we'll jump into some examples. How many of you here have coded a block before? Sweet. All right, so to build blocks, we use a function called register block type, and this is a JavaScript function that has a bunch of different, well, it has two parameters and a bunch of settings. So right now, most of the blocks are being registered in JavaScript. What that means is that WordPress builds your whole site, it launches the editor into the browser, and then once it's in the browser, it figures out what blocks are available, and it makes those blocks available. Now, this can be slightly prob problematic, and there's been a lot of discussion about should blocks be registered on the server side. <clears throat> if we are building blocks that, don't, that WordPress is not aware of at the server level, then there's some things that we cannot do with them very easily, like how do we figure out, based on user permissions, what blocks we should display? Or how do we figure out, um, what are some other things? There's some security stuff. Yeah. Post ID, so there are some things like how do we figure out the context of stuff that's going on? Actually, post ID is now available in the data store, so you can get that on the JavaScript side, only because WordPress is going on the server side, pulling out all the data, feeding it up into the JavaScript data, and making that available. But in general, uh, there are some things that you do need to register a block on the server for. So it's kind of weird. We have register block type camel case, for JavaScript, and we have register block type underscored for PHP. They both exist, this is a little confusing, and there's probably gonna be an evolution of naming conventions where you could use register block type on the, um, in your JavaScript, but if you're registering a block on the server, you'd call register block type um, in your PHP, and then in JavaScript, you'll still need to add some things, and maybe it'll be called like extend block or do something more, I, I haven't really heard exactly what this will be, but there, there are discussions on this. Now you don't, in a lot of cases, you don't need to worry about the server side and the client side will work fine. The other reason that they're not gonna pull everything out into the server is that Gutenberg ideally can still work as an independent editor completely outside of WordPress. So if you're building your own app and you wanna use this editor, then you could use it. But if everything is PHP tied, then that introduces um, some issues that you might not want to have inside of your app. As I mentioned, register block type takes two parameters, a name and settings, and these settings are as follows. I think I have them all here. We have a title, a description. Uh, right now, there are four or five set categories, but I believe that categories will be extended so that if you have a suite of blocks, you can kind of have them visually available in one area. Uh, I really love that you could add your own SVG icons, so if you could grab any icon you want and just convert it into a React style uh, SVG, throw it in there. Keywords, you have a bunch of different ways to search for a block, and I'll give you a little hack, because you can only have three keyword strings, but it will search for independent words in each one of those strings. So I'm not encouraging this, but I am letting you know it's possible. You can completely like black SEO it and uh, throw in a billion keywords, I think, um, and it'll find it. So don't tell anybody I told you that. There are some things that uh, you might want to turn on and off for block functionality for supports. There's not too much to this now, but <clears throat> if you use Gutenberg, for example, it spits out an automatic class name on the front end to all your blocks. You can turn this off. Um, in the editor, there's always a little CSS class names thing where you could add CSS to your, or a class name to your block. You might want to turn this off for certain users because they might start adding weird words and creating weird styles, so that's um, there. There's the ability to say, hey, don't let somebody edit the raw HTML of my block. They're gonna mess it up, so you could turn that off, things like that. Attributes are probably, for me, the most confusing part of Gutenberg when I got started. But basically, when stuff is stored, oh man. Yeah, we don't have time to explain attributes in enough depth. 
the basic aspect is anytime you have something in your block that's going to change, like you edit it or it's a setting somewhere, you have to keep track of that. And it does, it, it took me a while to figure out exactly what that model was. So um, just rest assured that if you're sitting there like, it's going on, you're, you're not alone. That, that, is, that, is, uh, that was my experience too. And then the last two are kind of the heart. So these last two are the biggest part of your block where you have to code out all edit functionality for your block. Like I said, you could get components. You could say, hey, give me a button here, give me an image upload thing. But you have to say what happens when they upload that image, right? Do I display that image? Do I put it here? What do you want to do with it? When they click this button, what's going to happen? So you have to code all of that, the, all of that yourself, which is following the React uh, format. It's not too bad, but the edit setting is going to be where you code your entire block in the editor. The save setting, on the other hand, just determines what format it's going to be stored into the database. Um, most blocks will write your save function in JavaScript. There are a few blocks where if you're keeping track of metadata or something that can be changed in other places in WordPress, while that data is stored in the database, it actually saves as blank data in the database and renders with PHP. So sometimes the save function is, is completely empty. It really depends on what you're trying to do. But for the most part, this is all going to be in one file until it gets too big to start pulling out the smaller ones, and all of this is part of your JavaScript. So this is a very limited view of it, but this is what an average block registration will look like. So just take a moment to look this over. You'll see a few things here, like the underscore underscore, right? That means that my block can be translated. And you'll see that the edit uh, right here is returning a function, actually, so that it can be called and executed. And this block will do nothing. In fact, probably uh, this would not be a worthy block to do. But it gives you an idea of what you're going to see as we move into the demos. All right. So that's all of Gutenberg development. I have a course on this, by the way, where I take about three hours to go over what I just said. So if you're interested in any of that in more depth, you could check that out. And I'll just pause real quick. Does anybody have questions about stuff before we jump into the code at kind of a high level here? Nailed it. OK, cool. If something comes to you, just uh, pop your hand up. All right, so the most basic and probably least helpful block you will be able to build is what's called a static block. And this is one that is completely uneditable. And I'll just kind of show you real quick what this would look like. <clears throat> Here, we have a block. You can't edit it. You can't do anything. You could add some CSS. But this is all just hard coded. So what are some use cases for this? Maybe you have a site where you do want to hard code blocks. Maybe it's a call out. Maybe it's a warning. Uh, maybe it's something that just doesn't change for some reason. Uh, this would be what, what it looks like. More than likely, you're, you're not going to build these. However, your static block is going to be your basic starting point for whatever you do. So there are some things in here I just want to take a moment to go over that you probably won't build, but sort of form a foundation for everything else you would want to do. I like to break my blocks up uh, pulling in files in two different ways. So I usually try to put block dependencies, which are my own code, first. So in this case, I'm importing an SVG icon. So I have a file here called icon. And I like the noun project, so I just copy my stuff from there and use that. And what that is is, if I search static, see the little Lego guy there? Or gal? Yes, Lego. And so this is what, obviously, this is a Lego SVG icon, right? You could all tell. So I have that file being pulled in. And I'll show you where I use it in a moment. And then I pull in my front end styles and then my editor styles. And most of the time, like I said, you won't really be having styles that just go on the editor side. Then we come down into WordPress dependencies. So the next thing I do, and notice that this is using import, right? Because these are separate files that JavaScript is importing, then Webpack is going to go through and pull them all together. With all the WordPress dependencies, we're using that destructuring, so it's not actually importing anything. So we could leave all of this out, and everywhere in my code where I have underscore underscore, I could just type WPI189 like that and remove this line of code. 
Okay, so this is purely for convenience factor only, but I would highly encourage you to do this up here. So anything that you need from WordPress, you're gonna pull in up here. And what we'll see is as we get into more complex things, this list grows, right? So that's gonna get bigger. Then we come down into our actual register block type. There's two parts to a name. You have to namespace everything, and then you have to give your block a unique name. What's cool about this is that later on in WordPress, it's going to do something like, is it blocks plural or blocks singular? It's going to apply a CSS class like this to your block. So at some point, you'll be like, where is that name coming from? And it's coming from basically the hardcore name of your block. You'll also need to use this um, as you get into some more complex blocks. Sometimes you need to register a block on the server side and you follow the same naming convention. I don't actually know, I haven't actually tried, I should. Can you put multiple namespaces in a single block or in a single plugin? Like can I have some blocks with one namespace and some blocks with another? Hmm. Okay, we'll find out one day. I, I name them all the same, I imagine you can. Um, but in general, this is gonna be like your plugin name or something like that generic. We have the title and description. I'll just show you real quick where these show up in a block. If we, I really love that they added hover over blocks. Thank you, design team, that's so cool. If we click into a block, notice this description over here, and we've got the title. And when you're searching for a block, you're going to see all the names of the blocks here. So that searchable name is what the title is. And the keywords here I'm gonna jump down to, notice that the word banner is nowhere in my block title. But if I search for banner, you all know this, you watch the WordCamp US talk, right? Um, that that is going to be there. So the next thing we have down here is category. Like I said, there are a few default categories. We've got common blocks, formatting, layout, widgets, sorry, and then we have our embedded blocks. So you could define where you want your block to go. Sometimes it's a little confusing where your block should go, and then I've, my understanding is that eventually this will evolve, I think, so that you could have my blocks category and set up your own one, but right now you cannot. Icon, a little just sex for you. Um, this is basically just referring to the icon that we pulled in before, the keywords. And then we get down into the actual edit functionality. So I'm going to skip at this point to a more um, complicated block that allows you to edit stuff like this one. I've got five minutes left, so uh, hopefully I can get through this one. Example form fields. Okay, so here's a block with a whole bunch of editable stuff. You'll notice that it's got form fields here and it's got form fields here and they're mapped to each other. You would never do this, right? But um, just for demo purposes, uh, to see how this would work. So in a more complex block like this, I'm going to break out functionality into different places. So if I come down to register, wait. Notice that I pull in this thing called edit, and when I go to do, to load like an inspector, I'm going to pull in these other files. And so at this point, I've taken all the edit functionality and broken it out into its own file. So eventually you're gonna to get to the point where your stuff becomes so complicated that you need to start pulling files out separately, and this is where you would do that. I'm also doing a lot of things. Every single one of these form fields is a built-in native component in WordPress, so I did no custom coding here to do any of these things, and I think that that is so cool that we get all of this out of the box. So I'll just show you real quick. Remember I said that there's the components library? You can go into components, and I've got a checkbox control, a radio, a range, a text, all these different ones set up. And then I just wanna show you one last thing here in how they work. Um, so whenever we have a form element or something like that, there are some baked in like labels and things like that, and then, there's a better one, the color palette. We pass in a default color palette, so if they've already saved this block, we load that value automatically. And then this is the very reacty way of determining how a block should be handled on change. And this is probably going to handle like 90% of your save changes 
well, maybe less depending on the complexity. But you basically say, hey, every time this color palette gets changed, take the new value, go back to my list of attributes or changeable elements, and give me the new one. So this is, this is all the wiring you would have to do to make this entire thing work. All you have to say is, up here, give me the color palette, and then down here, set the default value, and then determine what happens on change. And you'll see some of these are more complex, like you have to set some default options, but they all follow this basic convention of value and change. So at this point, we have two minutes left, and I wish that I could take, you know, like I said, many more hours. The course I have is about five or six hours long, and you could go through that for um, more on this. I'm also happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, I'll put this up here for anybody who's interested, and then, I don't know, probably not time for questions, or maybe one or two, or uh, let's do this. Come find me afterwards if you have questions. I'd love to chat more about Gutenberg. And thank you all so much for the opportunity to come here and talk with you all.